Hello, I am John Abbott, the producer and editor of A Nostalgic Oral History of Shell Farm. Episode number four is entitled Bricks and Mortar. It takes you on a tour of Main Street using vintage movie films, photos, and stories going as far back as the 1920s. And we proceeded with uh, great care and respect for the, uh, not only the building itself, but the building that they, is surrounded by a community that has a very deep and, uh, I say, not only a deep, but the family roots here are still intact. So I think there's still probably a good number of third generation families living in this town and I think that's extraordinarily compelling. One time all of the mail came in and out of Chalfont on the railroad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were certain trains that were mail trains, mm -hmm. and uh, they had the, a baggage car on it. And they, you know, that's where the the mail uh, was delivered. And then the station master had to bring it up the hill or take it down the hill to be there when the train came. That that is, I remember it. That's right. Uh, and yeah. Jane, your father was the post. Master of Shell Fund. That's correct. And we have a photo of dedicating the flagpole. Yes. And do you remember a story about him, his staff packing chickens? Absolutely, from Kraut's Chicken Farm out on 202 before you get to County Line Road. They would bring them, the chicks in, in boxes, maybe. 36 inches square, divided into four sections with 25 chicks in each section of the big box. He would process the boxes, how much it would cost to ship them, and then the station master, one of the Roy Ann's, would come up with a big wheelbarrow, load up about four boxes on the wheelbarrow, and take them down the hill, stack them up, ready for when the next train came through. Yep. Go ahead, you tell them. <laughs> Dr. Inches. I think his first name was Howard, Howard Inches. He was on Butler Avenue. I remember packing pills in bottles. He was like a so-called health doctor. <laughs> Most of them were shipped out somewhere. Uh, well, uh, uh, he used to go around and, and give lectures, and he had a, a two or three day uh, lecture in Chalfont, and uh, he had people come from all over the country. It was basically a mail order type of operation, and uh, so there was not uh, enough. Uh, well, the hotel wasn't taking overnight guests, so he went around town and asked uh, people to take uh, uh, these uh, people coming to his lecture in. Uh, for those two or three days, and uh, my mother and father did take in uh, a lady. I have no idea where she was from anymore uh, at that time. So he was par apparently fairly well known uh, throughout the country. I don't know how uh, he got his business started, but uh, uh, as as Gene said, it, it, most of his business was mail order.
I lived in Chalfont for 35 years. Lived on North Main Street from 39 to 62. It was real small, <laughs> maybe four, five, six. The bank was robbed, and then they sent. I assume was the FBI, but I'm not sure. But sent the people into our house with violin cases, which of course I didn't know anything about. And they go upstairs and into my sister's bedroom, and they must have set up their guns on the window sills, what out that window, because it looked right out that window to the front of the bank across the street. But as far as I know, nothing ever happened after that time when the bank was robbed. And that goes back quite a ways. Okay, I'm Dolores Loss, and uh, I've lived in Chaffin all my life. In fact, I was born here. It was a big joke in the family was I was born here and never got out, but I'm happy here, and I've had uh, 80, 88 years here, and uh, it's a pretty great place to live. And we moved to Chaffin when I was five. Um, I've lived here ever since. Um, it's no place like Chalkland as far as I'm concerned. Um, at the mill, they made hose stockings. So silk, silk stockings? Silk stockings, right. Um, and the girls that worked at the mill um, would come over to the Swartley Sweet Shop for lunch. Um, every day, there would be at least a half, at least a dozen women that came over and had lunch at our uh, sweet shop, which uh, two doors up there was a drug store and they had a um, soda fountain and they decided to sell the soda fountain. My mother bought all the equipment from them and opened the sweet shop in our house. I think she paid something like 25 or 50 dollars for everything that <clears throat> she needed to start the, the sweet shop from that. And it was basically, basically ice cream? Or? Ice cream, sandwiches. sandwiches. Um, it was a place in town for the kids to go. But there was no other soda fountain in town. So the kids would all congregate there. They would have the jukebox and they'd play it all, the, all night <laughs> till Mother would close around midnight, I guess. Right, and during the war, we had to pull the curtains down so that uh, there was no light in the airway. And one time, my father was the air raid warden, and one time the curtains were not down far enough and he saw the soda, he saw the jukebox and he came in and almost shut us down because we were violating the no light provision. They used to throw something over the jukebox. Right. Like some coats or something of the kids, they'd throw it over to, to keep the light out, but I guess they didn't throw them over good enough that night. And but, that, so. So did the kids dance or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What were the dance type? What were the dances? Jitterbug. It was the jitterbug yeah. mostly. So all the teenagers in town would come. Right. To, and. And your mother didn't mind. Of that. Oh, she loved. She them. loved it. And Joe Halberg, uh, Herman Halberg, you'll probably hear about him. He would come down and bring his dog, and that dog would sit out on the porch and wait for him until he <laughs> decided to go home. I, so what, what was the food, the uh, ice, ice cream floats oh, or an ice, ice cream, cream cones? And ice cream sundaes, I, uh, banana splits, milkshakes. Another thing that, that I remember, and I was young, but when the war started and the boys start being drafted, every night, before that boy was leaving for camp, I might get a little emotional. Mother would close the store at a certain time, 
she'd make a big spaghetti dinner for all the kids that were there for a send-off for those kids. And actually, because of the war is why she had to shut it down, because you just could not get, you couldn't get the uh, supplies for it. Where'd the ice, ice cream come from? Philly. Philadelphia, it was Briars, and they had gas rationing, and that's why they send it up on the train where Phil and I would go bring it home in the little red wagon. And we all hated the job of being on duty during the and, dinner hour. Yeah. In fact, you learned to eat your food really fast so that uh, if you had to go wait on somebody while we were having dinner. Sundays were 10 cents, banana splits were 20, so milkshakes were 15. Um, and, and you could also get what was called a trip around the fountain, which it was a fountain and they had um, different syrups, which you pushed the button and, you know, the syrup came out. So if they were real adventurous, they'd ask for a trip around the fountain. And that meant they would get a little bit of each of the different syrups. Yeah. But um, it, was, I mean, it was not a very tasty drink, but some people yeah. liked it. And Hamilton Street was really the industrial portion of Chapa. One street, yeah. <laughs> our, our industrial. City. <laughs> right. And That was built by a man by the name of Liebfried, and he lived on Main Street, um, but that mill was built on Hamilton Avenue in around there in the back, uh, further back on the road, not up close to the street. And uh, it started up, and he also employed people from around there. He, he, he started up shortly before the war and then when the war came both mills were really stressed because uh, at the previous to the war they made most of the stockings out of silk and of course silk uh, coming into the country was down to nil and uh, most of the silk that was available was used by in the war effort so um, the, those mills were really stressed. The mill didn't last very long um, after that. <coughs> and I think it was in the late 40s, maybe early 50s, very, very early 50s, that a company named Luxor bought the mill. And they started to make um, stainless steel uh, home kitchenware um, utensils. This was made at that manufacturing plant and my mother gave that to me when I got married 68 years ago and we still use it today. There was the pit catcher lanes that was on uh, 202, 202. Um, Bobby Shantz, my daughter's uh, all, all, not all of them, Three of the, our daughters worked for Bobby Shantz. And, uh, and then there was uh, Joe Astros had the bowling alley. He used to live in Chalfon too. Um, and that was a good place to go. I've known, I've known Bobby personally since the mid 80s until today. Um, I knew him when they built the Bowling alleys, the pit catcher with Joe Astroff in '79. So I started bowling leagues then, <laughs> and bowled there till about the mid to later '90s, with a lot of different teams and had, had a lot of fun there. I have no idea why he picked Chalfont. He and well, 
he lived in Amber, and uh, Joe Ashtoff lived in Chalfont. He lived down near uh, Unami Junior or Unami Middle School, I guess it was then. I guess it's high, junior high now. But that might have been one reason with uh, Joe Ashtoff living in Chalfont. Uh, we we had Weimer's store where Manhattan Bagel is now. That uh, is neat. That was then Barlson's bought it. Um, Weimer's store sold everything. It it was sort of dark. Everything looked wooden, and um, but they sold everything. They, a man and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Weimer, worked in it. Right. And. Uh, they had, Joe told me one time, they used, we, the kids used to wear what they called galoshes instead mm. of boots. And he would go upstairs in the Weimer store because that's where they had the galoshes. Yeah. yeah. And the knickers. Yeah. <laughs> knicker pants. Well, they had that up at uh, Moyer's store, too. So Bartleson's bought it from Weimer's. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about Reese's Candy Shop? Remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, you could get ice cream, 25 cents. Uh, it was, like a cone. A, it was in a paper thing, and you roll it, and they oh, push the ice cream out. Well, you it. could get a, a quart for 25 oh, yeah. cents. <clears throat> oh, yeah, a cone would be like a nickel. Right. And they made candy. Well, I don't know anything about the bakery, but... Um, I do remember that that was, um, when I was a kid, that was Reese's Candy. He was in there, the Reese family lived there, and they made candy. They made candy primarily around Christmas and Easter. Halloween, they used to give out ice cream. And this one Halloween, uh, Bibi and Audrey got dressed, and they took me down and in our disguise. And we got ice cream. We thought that was pretty good. So we went home and we quick changed into different clothes and went back down again. And I can remember her saying, get, get. <laughs> I think you girls were here before. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of pe different people in there. There are Civil War soldiers in there. There's World War soldiers, one and two, the Spanish-American War, and the Vietnam War, and I believe I found one from possibly Afghanistan. And there's people that were the movers and the shakers who were involved in land transfers and everything, and in, at that time of day, money was land. It wasn't accumulating, you know, like we do today in banks. It was in the land that they owned. He graduated from medical school in 1906, did an internship in Carlisle, and came to Chalfont in 1907. Uh, he was on 30 Main Street initially. And uh, moved up the street, I don't know, late teens, early 20s to 130. Uh, Main Street. When he first moved to Chalfont, he was a horse and buggy doctor. Uh, in fact, uh, I once had the insurance policy for his horse, and the horse's name was Maud. And I think the annual premium on Maud was 75 cents. Uh, if you look in his, his uh, ledger, an office visit early on was 25 cents, and a a visitation, he called it a visitation, was a dollar. He made house calls in any kind of weather and the legendary story of my grandfather was at 76 years of age, he went out in the blizzard on the back of somebody's tractor to make a house call. I have, I have all of his ledgers at one time. I've given a couple to my brothers and other people in the family. But in going through the ledgers, uh, there's evidence that cash was always not coin of the realm. I, I noticed that he had a bushel of apples in payment one time, boxes of cigars, 
And I believe for a long time, at least when he had Maud, that he traded uh, medical service for feed, hay, and possibly stable time for the horse that he used before he got a car. Um, there were several instances of trade for, for service, though. He was still practicing in 1968 when he fell and broke his hip and uh, died of systemic shock. He never closed the practice. So was he a doctor and the Burgess of Shelfont at the same time? He was, uh, at least for 36 years worth of it. You figure he went from 1907 to 1968 as town doctor. Not the only one toward the end, but he still had a practice. People came in for the black pills. He, when you went to see Dr. Burkhart, he had great big bottles of pills. And whenever he would put pills in like an envelope, and that's how you got your medication. And everything got, you got those big black pills. I don't care what was wrong with you, he came out with a big black pill. Welcome to my home. This is uh, 145 North Main Street in Chalfont, Pennsylvania. This is the borough of Chalfont, a whole, what is it, 1.4 square miles, I think, maybe, give or take. Anyway, um, I moved into this house in 1998. I bought the home from Andy Stoller and his wife. Um, Andy was the mayor at one point of Chalfont, and to this day, when people ask me where I live and I tell them, they're like, oh, you live in Andy's house. Um, someday it'll be known as mine, but for now it's referred to as Andy's house. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the original owner who actually had this house built was um, Dr. Wesley Massinger, and he was the town vet. Um, he had an architect, uh, Oscar Martin, who's pretty well known both here at and in Doylestown, and he did at one point have an animal hospital, but that seems to be the big mystery as to whether that hospital existed on this property before he had this house built, or whether it was in a different location. Um, that seems to be uh, an unanswered question right now. Um, but, but a lot of transformations happened over the years. It had been divided into an upstairs and a downstairs for two families to live here. And, uh, and when Andy Stoller uh, purchased the property, he took the original blueprints and, and with a lot of labor and a lot of love, put this house back into its original single family dwelling. The third floor, um, at one point, Andy told me that there was a cistern in a little depressed area on the third floor. You have to step down into it. And uh, the story is told that during times of prohibition, there were secret meetings up there. And there is a, there is a, um, a bar type area in that third floor space. And um, I don't know what exactly went on during that time, but, but it is known that they, they did have secret meetings up there. Um, that's the only way you could drink back then. My name is John Hartzell. Um, I'm an attorney in Doylestown and I'm a relative of the founder of the Chalfont, of the Hartzell's Mill in Chalfont. 
The mill on Park Avenue was founded by my great-great-grandfather in 1860. He bought that mill, uh, having moved there from Montgomery County. Uh, Francis Dietz Hartzell, that's the F.D. Hartzell, Francis Dietz. He owned the mill, bought it in 1860, operated it very well for many years. Uh, unfortunately, a fire burned down the mill in 1878 and it was rebuilt and continued thriving. F.D. Hartzell died in 1888 and the mill was turned over to two of his sons, B. Frank Hartzell and James Hartzell, who continued to run the mill uh, well into the 1900s and they turned it over then to B. Frank's two sons, two of his sons, Russell Hartzell, who was my grandfather, and uh, his brother, Stuart Hartzell, who operated the mill until 1950 when Russell Hartzell passed away, and then Stuart Hartzell, the surviving brother, owner of the mill, sold his interest sometime in the 1950s. So it began with my great-great-grandfather, F.D. Hartzell, to my great-grandfather, B. Franklin Hartzell, then to my grandfather, Russell Hartzell, and then it was sold in the 1950s.